mean? It means they took a group of uh, 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 a group of people, a group of kids, uh, babies who have cancer, and 4858 controls. In other words, they took two, group, uh, two groups of people with cancer and without cancer. Uh, main outcome, risk of all childhood cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, and central nervous system, tumors measured by odds ratio. Now, we said that the odds ratio is the measure that we do for case control study. And this is the result. This is a simplified uh, form of the results. But we have, in this case, 305 babies exposed to radiation. Uh, we have 7242 not exposed to radiation. But this is not the right way to look at it now. Why? Because it's a case control study. We should look at how many cases and how many controls. Because we started with the cases and the controls. So I can say I have 2690 cases, 4857 controls. And among those cases, 120 were exposed to radiation, 2570 were not, uh, 185 uh, uh, exposed in the controls, 4672 not exposed to radiation. So what do I do? I calculate the odds ratio, and the odds ratio would be 1.18. Since it's more than one, I can conclude that radiation increases the risk of uh, uh, cancers, okay? Now, the challenges, there are some challenges in a case control study. One of them is selecting the cases. Selecting the cases, uh, you have to have very, spe uh, to be very specific in the selection criteria. You have to make sure that the cases you include into your study are eligible. You have to make sure that the cases are not very severe cases. Because if you select very severe cases, your study conclusion will be affected because you are comparing people with no uh, cancer, for example, to very severe cancer cases. But at the same time, you have to select them not to be very healthy cases because the uh, comparison will be wrong. So you have to make sure, again, that the cases you select into your study are representative of all cases who are in the population. Selecting the controls, it's more important to select representative controls uh, uh, into the study. I don't want to get very healthy controls. I don't want to ha get very sick controls. I have to have controls who are representative of the population again. This is why I can have, let's say, neighborhood controls. In other words, if I take a, uh, a person who have cancer from a certain community, I go take his or her neighbor so that to make sure that they are comparable with each other. I can have hospital controls. I can have next of kin controls. So there are so many different ways to select controls, but it's very important that you select the proper set of controls. The most challenging part in a case control study is the exposure assessment. Because I ask people 10 years ago or five years ago, what was happening with you? So the longer the period in the past is, the lower the quality of the information I will get. So if I ask a person 10 years ago how many uh, pills of this drug you were you taking, most probably they will not give me accurate information. So the exposure assessment is a major challenge in case control studies. Case control studies usually are not taken as one-to-one -one ratio. In other words, uh, I do not take one case and one control. For instance, I do not take 100 cases and 100 controls. Okay? I can take more controls as compared to cases. And it has been established that the more controls you take, the better your study is. In other words, this would be the number of controls per case. If I'm talking about one, it means one control per each case. So if I take 100 uh, uh, cases, I will take 100 controls. Two means two controls per case. So if I take two, uh, the, uh, 200 cases, I should to, uh, take 400 controls, and so on. Three controls per, per case, four controls per case, and so on and so forth. This is a Pittman efficiency. It's a score that's given as a reflective of the efficiency of the study or the power of the study. It has been shown that the more controls that you take, the better the study is, up to four controls. So if you take one control per case, two, three, four, but after four, it more or less plateaus. This is why most of the good, control, uh, most of the good case control studies uh, 
are taken as four controls per case. If you look at the literature, most of the good con uh, case control studies will be four controls per case. Advantages of a case control study, it's cheap. Why? Because I'm basing my exposure assessment in the past. I do not have to follow people up in the future. So it is cheap. I do not have to spend a lot of time on, uh, 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 on following up people. Requires short time when outcomes are delayed. Assume that I am talking about uh, cancer. Cancer has a long latency period, right? So uh, it might have 10 years latency or 15 years or so on and so forth. But basically, since I'm starting with cancer positive and cancer negative, do I have to wait for 10 years to see the effect? No, because the effect has already occurred. I go to the literature, uh, to the history, 10 years ago, who had radiation, for example, radiation positive and radiation negative. So, radiation negative. So in this case, when outcomes are delayed, such as cancer, uh, it requires a short period of time. I do not have to wait for 10 years. I do it on the spot. Study multiple exposures. If I take cancer and no cancer, okay, am I only looking at radiation? No, I can look at radiation, at smoking of the mother, at drugs taken, and so on. So I can take one outcome, but multiple exposures, okay? So in a case control study, I can take one outcome, but multiple exposures. Appropriate for rare diseases, I will talk about it when I talk about the cohort studies. The disadvantages are the biases. Selection, when you select a wrong control group. Information bias, because you're asking people to give you information long time ago, they tend to forget. Confounding, incomplete information on confounders, which means that I do not have full information on other factors such as uh, physical activity, diet, lifestyle, and so on and so forth. Back to, the, uh, to this uh, uh, layout, uh, under observation studies, I have a cohort study. So what is a cohort study? We have talked so far about cross-sectional and case control. Cross-sectional, I'll take a group of people and I divide them according to exposure and outcome, right? The case control is where I start with the outcome. I take the outcome and go back to the exposure. So logically speaking, the cohort study should, stat should start with the exposure and go to the outcome. So a cohort study is a study where I have a defined population, and of course time is forward, but the direction of the study is forward as well. So how do we start? We take a sample of people. Do we take any sample? No, not like cross-sectional study. In a cross-sectional study, we took any sample. We took a sample and then we divided people. In a case control, the sample was dependent on disease, no disease. In cohort study, the sample is dependent on exposed, non-exposed. And we have to follow them up to see who develops the outcome and who does not develop the outcome. In other words, I have a certain period here I have to follow them up for. Sometimes it might be one day, sometimes it might be 30 years, okay? Depending on the question that you have. For instance, if you might look at short-term outcome, if a person is taking drug A or drug B, does it modify, uh, let's say, headache after 24 hours? What's the length of follow-up? It's only 24 hours. You wait for 24 hours, you'll have your outcome. But sometimes, if you are talking about uh, uh, maternal cigarette smoking and cancer development in the offspring, so you take people according to their smoking status because you are starting with the exposure. So some people who are smokers, some people who are non-smokers, you follow them up, but for how long? You have to follow them up for maybe 30 or 40 years to see the babies, whether they will develop cancer or not. So the point is the follow-up period depends on the topic that you are dealing with. Again, the two by two table, the same thing. But am I going to calculate a prevalence rate? No. Because I'm not calculating prevalence now. I'm calculating something called incidence. And I would expect that you understand what's the difference between prevalence and incidence. Incidence is the occurrence of the new cases. Because in a cohort study, people who develop the outcome are new cases. So I do not calculate prevalence ratio. I do not calculate odds ratio. I calculate something called the relative risk. The relative risk is calculated exactly the same as the prevalence rate ratio.
So it's A over A plus B. This is the, uh, the risk in this group. C over C plus D, which is the risk in this group. Let us take an example again. This is physical activity and incidence and incident cognitive impairment in, elder, uh, in elderly patients. So when they say incident, what does incident mean? Incident means new cases, new people. So the background information, uh, I'm not going to read this. I'm going to read, we examined whether physical activity is associated with incident cognitive impairment during follow-up. So there's a follow-up. It's a cohort study. As part of community-based prospective cohort study, and this is why most cohort studies are prospective in nature, because we'd go forward, whereas case control are retrospective because we go backward. So 3903 participants older than 55 were enrolled and followed up for two years. Physical activity was the exposure, so they, div they divided physical activity in these groups and so on. The main outcome measure was incident cognitive impairment after two years of follow-up. So what was the follow-up period? Two years. After two years, they decided whether uh, uh, they, they had uh, cognitive impairment or not. This is the table. Are we going to say 285 people with cognitive impairment and 182 with no cognitive impairment? No. Since it's a cohort study, we are starting with the exposure. You say 1523 people with moderate physical activity and 584 people with no physical activity. And I want to compare. After two years of follow-up, I found, or they found, 160 out of those 1523 the uh, developed cognitive impairment as compared to 125 uh, versus uh, 584 in the no physical activity group. What they did was they calculated the relative risk. So again, what's nice about the relative risk is that it is explained or it is interpreted exactly the same as the odds ratio or prevalence rate. We calculated the relative risk and we found it to be equal to 0.49. Now. We said that if it's equal to one, no association. More than one, it increases the risk. Less than one, it decreases the risk. So in this case, it's less than one. So how do we interpret this relative risk? We say those who are having moderate physical activity have lower chances of developing cognitive impairment as compared to those who do not have any physical activity. Now, the advantages of a cohort study, study multiple outcomes. Uh, uh, in other words, if they are talking, if we are talking here on physical activity, can we look at anything other than cognitive impairment? Absolutely. I can look at an outcome being quality of life, at myocardial infarction, at uh, whatever. So the point is, in a cohort study, I can study multiple outcomes. In a case control study, I can study multiple exposures. So one of the advantages is study multiple outcomes. And the other uh, advantage is appropriate for uh, rare exposures. I will talk about them later. The disadvantages, it's expensive. Why? Because I have to see people now, and after some time, and after some time, and so on and so forth. It is a follow-up study. Long follow-up, in this case, they had to wait for two years. But sometimes you have to wait for 10 or 15 years. Loss to follow-up, the longer I ask people to be involved in my study, the less people will I have at the end of the study. So if I start with 100 patients now, after 10 years, I do not expect them to be 100 patients. I expect them to be maybe 80 or 70 or 60 or whatever. So I have the loss to follow up. This is a, uh, a summary of case control and cohort. So uh, actually, and cross-sectional study. So this is time, OK? I have a cross-sectional study where exposure and outcome are measured at one point in time, OK? I do not start with exposure and go to the outcome. I don't start with outcome and go to the exposure. Cross-sectional study is where exposure and outcome are measured at one point in time. In a cohort study, I start with the exposure and go to the outcome, prospective. In a case control study, I start with the outcome and go to the exposure, OK? The third uh, or, or the second type of uh, uh, categories of studies is the experimental uh, studies. We have covered the uh, uh, cross-sectional, case control, cohort studies, but now we are going to talk about experimental studies. Now, to illustrate the clinical trials, which is the main type of uh, experimental studies, I'll just show you this. And uh, if I ask, what does it remind you of? 
everybody should see that it is the same as the cohort study. Now, uh, we have a group of people, we take a sample, we divide them according to their exposure, and we follow them up in time to see uh, the outcome. Now, the only difference between a cohort study and the clinical trial is the intervention. In a cohort study, the researcher, in a cohort study, the re researcher only observes those people who are exposed and those people who are not exposed. The researcher does not interfere with the management or the treatment of the patient. Whereas in an intervention or a clinical trial or an experimental study, the researcher himself or herself are the ones who decide who is going to take the exposure and who's going to not take the exposure. So basically the researcher is not an observer anymore. The, per, uh, the researcher is the investigator or the person who applies the intervention. Uh, and the same thing applies. We follow people up and we see what's happening with them. Let us take an example. Vitamins C and E for the prevention of preeclampsia in women with type 1 diabetes. A randomized placebo controlled tri trial. By the end of this uh, small uh, uh, talk about uh, clinical trials, you should be able to understand what these mean. But it is a clinical trial in this case, and uh, the intervention is about vitamin C and E. So the background, uh, uh, it's specified here why do they want to do the study. And they say we aim to assess whether supplementation with vitamin C and E reduce incidence of preeclampsia in women with type 1 diabetes. Now, we enrolled women from 25 UK antenatal metabolic clinics in multicenter randomized trial, eligibility criteria, and then women were randomly allocated to receive 1,000 milligram vitamin and so on and so forth, or matched placebo daily until delivery. This is a very important key point in this clinical trial. In other words, when we say women were randomly allocated, what does it mean? It means the investigator was the one who differentiated or who gave people either the active drug or the placebo. The placebo here is a drug that has no effect. It's a passive drug, so it's like a uh, sugar pill, so that the patient would feel that they are taking a drug, but in fact they are not taking anything. And I will talk about this bias later. But the point is, is it an observational study? No, because the researcher did not observe those who are taking the uh, vitamin C and D and those who are not taking anything. It would have been a cohort study. But in this case, the researcher was the one who decided who would take what. Okay, there's something else that's uh, uh, specified here. This study is registered uh, and there's a registration number. Nowadays, if you want to publish a clinical trial in a good journal, they will ask you about the registration number. In other words, uh, before you start a clinical trial, you should go into certain websites where they will tell you, register your, website, uh, your clinical trial. You will specify the objectives of the clinical trial, the sample size needed to be, uh, needs to be calculated, and so on and so forth, so that you will not change the methodology as you go along. So most of the clinical trials published nowadays, they should have a registration number. This is the two by two table of the clinical trial. And of course, we say that vitamin C and D, you have 375 people and 374 people with no uh, drug or the placebo. Now, uh, we were the ones who gave these two drugs to different people. And 57 out of the 375 developed preeclampsia and 374, uh, 70 out of 374 in the no drug. Now, what do we calculate? We calculate similar to the cohort study. We calculate the relative risk. And 57 out of 375 is 